Wednesday night, May 11th, we begin a four-week series based on end times. Stephen Armstrong is going to be our guest teacher. I would encourage you to seriously consider clearing your calendar for the four consecutive weeks beginning Wednesday night, May 11th, for a wonderful study on what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church about these latter days. Because of our construction, unfortunately, we won't have capacity for child care or be able to offer the messages online by live stream, but they will be recorded and you can access them uh, on on Stephen Armstrong's uh, webpage called Verse by Verse. But I hope you'll be here in person. I want to see that that, that I would like to encourage you to be a part of this great study. Let's pray together and then we're going to look at Daniel chapter 4. Heavenly Father, we have studied, we have opened your word, we have prepared, but Lord God, the greatest work of any team would fall short without the blessing of your Holy Spirit. So we welcome you now, Spirit. We welcome you. We wait on you. We urge you to come. Thank you. Through Jesus, we offer this earnest prayer. And all who agreed with it said, when he wasn't flying his private jet across the Atlantic or watching sunsets from one of his yachts, he was living a life of luxury inside his 10,000 square foot Lexington Avenue penthouse in New York City. His yacht cost $7 million. His jet cost $24 million. He had a home in France. He had a beach home in Montauk. He had a house in Palm Beach. He had boats and cars. She had furs and designer handbags, Wedgwood, China, and Tiffany Crystal. When it came to decor, they spared no expense. Gold sconces lined the wallpaper and Central Asian rugs covered the floors and Greek and Egyptian statues competed for the attention and the approval of guests. Oh, the guests. There were so many who wanted to know them. People stood in line to shake his hand. People like Steven Spielberg and Ellie Wiesel. To stand in his Manhattan office was to stand in the epicenter of investment success, or so it seemed. Then came the morning of December 10th, 2008, and that's when the charade ended. That's when Bernie Madoff knew he had been caught, and that is when he told his wife and two sons, it's all a lie. It's a great big Ponzi scheme. Over the next days, weeks, and months, the staggering details became public knowledge. Madoff was the mastermind of a 20-year-long shell game, the largest financial crime in U.S. history. He swindled people, rich and poor alike, out of billions of dollars. His collapse was of biblical proportions. Within short order, he was stripped of his fame, stripped of his status, stripped of his money. He had no future, and he had no family. One son committed suicide. The other son changed his last name. His wife to this day is in seclusion in South Florida. And 74-year-old Bernie Madoff will spend every day of the rest of his life 
as prisoner number 61727054 in the Federal Corrections Complex of Butner, North Carolina. What happened? What would cause a man to dedicate his life to swindling others? What was the trade-off for Madoff? In a word, pride, status, recognition. According to one biographer, he was spurned and humiliated as a kid for his inferior intellect, rejected by one girl after another, relegated to lesser classes and lesser schools, but he excelled at making money, and with it came the stature that had eluded him. Madoff's addiction to attention reminds us of another story of great wealth and sudden collapse. In fact, the rise and fall of Madoff is small potatoes when compared with the vast ownings and sudden free fall of our character in today's study, King Nebuchadnezzar. The story of Daniel covers the period between 605 and 539 B.C. And the life of Daniel intersected with some of the most fascinating leaders of dynasties in the history of the world, the first of which, and perhaps the most of which, was the dynasty of King Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king who overthrew Jerusalem and took the young people into Babylonian captivity. He was also prone to strange dreams, which Daniel interpreted, and when he did, gained favor with the king and was promoted by the king. Nebuchadnezzar not only promoted Daniel, but boy, Nebuchadnezzar loved to promote Nebuchadnezzar. As we saw last week, Nebuchadnezzar erected a 90-foot tall statue, golden statue, in honor of himself and commanded people to bow down and worship it. Three Hebrews refused. Does anyone remember their names? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And when they refused to bow down, he had them plucked up and thrown into a fiery furnace that had been heated to seven times its original heat. But when they were unsinged, he came unhinged. And he began to ask, Who is this God who is greater even than fire? We would think that by now, Nebuchadnezzar would be getting the message. The three Jews were saved. The dream was interpreted. Certainly, Nebuchadnezzar is understanding that God is trying to get his attention and that God has a program that includes the king, but it doesn't revolve around the king. But does King Nebuchadnezzar get the point? I don't think so. Daniel chapter 4 suggests not. And the chapter opened in the words of the king himself. Do you like to fill in the blanks? You'll find one in your weekend handout. Here's blank number one. We start with the king's dream. The king's dream. Some scholars believe that 20 or 30 years may have elapsed between the events of the golden statue and what we're studying today out of chapter 4. King Nebuchadnezzar was enjoying a time of peace and prosperity. His enemies were at bay. His wealth was secure. And in the midst of it all, he had a dream. He asked his fortune tellers to tell him what it meant. Again, they could not, but Daniel could. So he called on Daniel, and here's what he said. These are the visions I saw while lying in bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant. And on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter. The birds lived in the branches. And from it, every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in bed, I looked and there before me was a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. And he called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but let the stump and its roots, bound with iron and bronze, remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven 
and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. Daniel listened to this dream and he gulped. He was astonished and troubled by what he heard. Daniel's face grew pale and the king had to con- convince the Jew to speak to him So Daniel did, and he explained the tall tree. He explained the creature. He explained the sudden collapse and the appearance of the crazy animal. He explained the king's danger. You see, at this point in history, Nebuchadnezzar had no peers anywhere in the world. He was the uncontested ruler of the whole planet. Babylon, his city, rose out of the desert plains like a Manhattan skyline. The hanging gardens of Babylon, which he built for his wife, are one of the seven wonders of the world. His royal palace was immense. The walls were 387 feet high and 87 feet thick, wide enough for four chariots to ride abreast around the city and around the palace, which they often did. The mighty Euphrates River floated right through the center of Babylon. The population reached some two million people. The city had temples and terraces and palaces. And all of this happened during the 43-year dominion of Nebuchadnezzar. He was filthy rich. He was part oil baron, part royalty, part hedge fund billionaire. Were he alive today, he would by far and away outrank any billionaire on the earth. He would be the only one listed in Forbes magazine. But all of this was about to end. The mighty tree was about to be reduced to a stump. Listen to Daniel's stump speech. I thought that was clever. You didn't. (laughs) Your majesty, you are that tree. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. The king is about to be reduced to a crazy man in a cage. Why? How do we explain this severe judgment? Well, let's read verse 26 again and see if you can pick it out, pick out the problem. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. You see, Nebuchadnezzar was afflicted by the oldest and most severe of maladies, pride. He thought he ran the world. He thought Babylonia ran the world. He thought his kingdom was running the world. King Nebuchadnezzar was all about King Nebuchadnezzar. His world revolved around him. And the dream that God sent him was intended to warn him that when the mighty fall, The fall is mighty. So Daniel gave him a heartfelt appeal. He said, therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. But did Nebuchadnezzar listen? Did Nebuchadnezzar repent? Now we look at the king's delay. Listen to this. Twelve months later, 
A full year passes. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is not this... No, let me change that. Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. God has been patient with Nebuchadnezzar. He sent him a message through the first dream that Babylon was the golden head of the statue, one but several ages that would come forward. He sent him a message through Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that there was a ruler in heaven that was greater than fire. He sent him a message through this dream that unless you repent, you're going to be reduced to a stump. He gave him 12 months. He gave him 12 months to change his ways. But Nebuchadnezzar just grew increasingly proud. He built his world around himself. John Elias, a renowned evangelist from the 18th century, once told of a visit he made to a blacksmith shop. The blacksmith had just acquired a new dog. And John Elias felt sorry for the dog because every time the blacksmith pounded the anvil with his hammer, which was a lot, the dog would squeal. Elias came back a few weeks later and saw that the dog had grown accustomed to the pounding of the hammer. A few weeks later, he was able to sleep while the master pounded. Nebuchadnezzar was able to sleep while his master pounded. He had grown accustomed to the warnings, and he did not respond. Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken away from you. You will be driven away from people, and you will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled he was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. The king became an ancient version of Howard Hughes with corkscrew fingernails and long hair, animalistic. One minute he was on the cover of Time magazine. The next he was banished and he became the beast of the Babylonian kingdom. He was left in a cage, and we are left with a lesson. Let's see what the king discovered. Look at the king's discovery. What is it? God hates pride. Do you see a person wise in their own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than him. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. The Lord detests the proud heart. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perverse speech. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. Why the strong language? Why the blanket condemnation? How do we explain God's abhorrence of a haughty heart? Simple. God hates pride. Because God loves his people. And pride is the poison pill of the soul. Pride is the poison pill of the soul. You see, pride prevents salvation. If all you see is self, you'll never see your Savior. If all you see is self, you will never see a savior. Salvation comes to the humble heart. The prideful heart refuses to confess sin. The prideful heart refuses to worship. Pride creates an inability for the knee to bow or the heart to confess. 
Pride causes a stubborn sense of lockjaw to come over the mouth. And pride-filled people can not worship. More people are being led to hell by the pied piper of pride than all the false religions in the world combined. The heart that can look up into the sky and say there is no God is the heart of pride. The heart that can witness miracle after miracle from sunrise to sunset and not be moved to worship God is a heart that is like Nebuchadnezzar encaged in pride and driven away from God. God hates pride because pride prevents salvation. And God hates pride because pride prevents reconciliation. Every week of my ministry, I meet somebody who refuses to reconcile with someone else because of pride, because of stupid, foolish, stubborn, chest-puffing pride. How many apologies have gone unoffered because of pride? How many friendships have gone unreconciled because of pride? How many neighbors refuse to get along with their neighbor because of pride? How many wars on our planet have been born out of the womb of arrogance and pride? Pride is the father of hatred, of jealousy, of bitterness, and sorrow. Pride precludes reconciliation. Marriages are disrupted. Families are destroyed. All because of stupid, irresponsible pride. It breaks God's heart. That's why he hates it. Pride is the hidden reef that shipwrecks the soul. And pride will drive you crazy. If we've learned anything from the story of Nebuchadnezzar, pride will leave you crazy. It will leave you separated from God and separated from others. Pride will leave you a sad, lonely, old, sour, lemon-sucking individual (laughs) with no friends and no faith. I love what Chris Seidman said. The truth is, Nebuchadnezzar didn't go insane when he suddenly started living as a beast, eating grass and growing his fingernails out. Nebuchadnezzar was insane before that. He was insane when he was walking on the roof of his palace, surveying his empire, thinking he had pulled all this off and that all this was all about him. Do you think there's a modern ring to the Nebuchadnezzar story? Do we live in a day in which people make a big deal out of people? The Apostle Paul gives us this warning. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful and proud. Any chance that describes you? If so, be careful. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. Don't be like the flea on the back of the elephant. When the elephant crossed the bridge, the structure began to swing and sway. When they reached the other side, the flea looked back at the still swinging bridge, and he said to the elephant, boy, we nearly broke that bridge down. (laughs) You know, in God's plans, we are the fleas, lovable fleas. Redeemed fleas, cherished fleas, but by comparison to God, we're small. And if this world shakes, it's because God shakes it. Not because you did, not because I did, not because anyone else did. 
Daniel said to the king, the decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the most high God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest, sets them over the lowliest of people. You see, God controls all human kingdoms and he's been known to humble the proud leader. I don't want you to miss this because if you miss this, you might fall. But if you get this, you'll be blessed. To the degree that God hates pride, he loves humility. To the degree he hates pride, he loves humility. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I saw an example of this last fall. I traveled to North Carolina to be a part of a weekend event with Michael W. Smith, the singer. Michael arrived Friday morning, I arrived Friday afternoon. We met later Friday afternoon to plan out the weekend, but I could hardly keep Michael's focus because he was so moved from a moment he had had just that day in the home of Dr. Billy Graham. He had arrived early and met with Dr. Graham at Dr. Graham's invitation because Dr. Graham wanted to prepare and plan for his own funeral. Dr. Graham had invited his pastor and Michael W. Smith to come to his house. At that point, Dr. Graham was 94 years of age, still keen of mind, but his health is failing. Cannot get out of a wheelchair, always on oxygen. Needs 24-hour care. But while his mind was still sharp, he wanted to plan his funeral. So he called Michael, he called his pastor, he gathered them in the room, And he said, I have only one request for my funeral. Of course, Michael and the pastor leaned forward and said, whatever you want. He said, my request is this, that you do not mention my name at my funeral. They asked him to repeat that request. He said, I don't want you to mention my name at my funeral. The only name I want to be mentioned is the name of Jesus Christ. Billy Graham has preached to well over a billion people, quite likely more than any person in the history of the world. He has filled stadiums on every continent in nearly every major city. He's been considered the spiritual advisor to nearly every president since Dwight D. Eisenhower. Yet he does not want his name to be mentioned at his own funeral. Only the name of Jesus Christ. Could it be that a person can grow so in love with God and their heart so covered with his glory and his goodness that their own accomplishments seem like straw and unworthy of being mentioned. That's the heart God blesses. That's the heart God loves. That's the heart to whom God gives grace. You know, Nebuchadnezzar learned this. I don't know if you've read the end of the story. It took him a while to learn this. Seven years passed, but he got the point. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back His hand or say to Him, What have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven, because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. I don't know if Babylonian cemeteries had tombstones and epitaphs, But if they did, that would have worked for his. 
those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Keep in mind as we close, plan A for Nebuchadnezzar did not include those seven years of discipline. Plan A was simply a dream, then a warning, then another dream, but Nebuchadnezzar didn't get the point. So God enacted plan B. Dear child of God, don't you wait on plan B. You listen to plan A. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the times that you have reminded us that you are great and we are small and that you are strong and that we are weak and that you are holy and we are sinners. We welcome that reminder, Father, even today. Great, great God of the universe, let there be grace in our lives that comes from humbling ourselves before you. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, I'll take Jesus. You take